Hi, John. Hi, Peter. I'm here with the filmmaker, critic, and cinephile Dan Salit. He's based in New York. His films include uh, The Unspeakable Act, 14, and All the Ships at Sea. Uh, thank you so much, Dan, for agreeing to talk with me. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so I wanted to ask you about, uh, I know you've touched on this in some interviews, um, Maurice Pila and his influence mm -hmm. for you on 14. And I wanted to ask you about that and also Pila and your life as a cinephile as well. Pila was somebody who took me a while to come to actually. I mean, I, 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 it didn't take me a while to like him. Uh, I saw Anoza Zamor, I think first and, and was an instant fan, but it took me a while to understand anything about him. He's so, there's something elusive about him. And I was making a film in 1990, shooting film in 1996 for called Honeymoon. When I was really thinking about PLI, I was thinking about like capturing that effect. And I think at that point I had a kind of a superficial understanding of the guy. I was just thinking of him in terms of these fast time jumps that are very easy to notice, but the meaning of them maybe was not so clear to me or the or the connection to his personality wasn't so clear to me. And over the years, I somehow, I feel as if I came to understand what he was, what drove him and what he cared about. Um, and by the time 14 came around, I feel like I'd internalized it and it was not so, uh, such a superficial uh, connection for me as it probably was the first time I tried to, I tried to do PLA, but um, I mean, obviously, you know, if, if you've seen some PLA films at the time, the way that he cuts through time without much warning, um, without much uh, either foreshadowing or connecting things afterwards is like really conspicuous. And in 14, I decided I wanted to pass through time that way without telling people how much time had passed, letting people figure it out later. But I think that for PLA, I think for PLA, almost everything about movies is um, is about him distrusting fiction and distrusting his own ability and everybody else's ability to simulate reality by means of fiction. And he's always trying to get around fiction and sneak something in there that was real at the time and, and that is you know, not is not something that he had to concoct for sentiment or for structure or anything. And gradually, I, I came to realize that that as a kind of a general principle that he trusted things more when they were coming from anywhere other than his imagination. He would take something an actor would say when they didn't know the camera was on. He would integrate people's personalities into a role that was not like their personality. And he felt that it was more real. And I came to I came to understand what he meant. It's kind of a, in a way, I think it's a vision of human nature, a kind of a not seeing people as unified, not seeing events even or meanings in everything, but seeing uh, that uh, that tendency to like put together a piece of this and a piece of that and just shove them together arbitrarily, seeing that as an accurate view of people and of our psychology and of the way a lot of things go. So I came over the years to think of Pila as kind of the, the fictional filmmaker who least trusted fiction and even his own fictionalizing impulse and felt the need always to, to trick reality into kind of appearing instead of planning anything or constructing anything around the general idea. I don't know if that's a good answer, but uh, I think that's kind of why PLA is important to me. And I would think of him every so often, not just when I was doing, planning a, a, a time jump. Mm -hmm. and, and do you have a favorite PLA film? It's a tough one. I know I'm more, which is very raggedy in some ways, is so great that it's got to be a candidate. The first one, uh, L'Enfance Nue, Naked Childhood, which was I believe it was called Me when it was released in the United States. Um, that is pretty competitive. Uh, it's really an amazing movie. And 
I really like uh, almost unbearably uh, sad or forbidding movie called the La Gueule, La Gueule Ouverte, uh, the open mouth, um, the open, yeah, the open mouth, the open snout. Yeah. <laughs> In French, gun is kind of slang for your face, you know? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Like, like shut your mouth. They would say, you know, ferme, ferme ton gueule, gueule, or ta gueule. So it, it doesn't really mean snout, but I think that's what it literally means. Mm -hmm. well, I, I saw um, um, Open Mouth uh, years ago. I was, I was struck by the, the the husband and obviously the wife. It's like it, it, it dying the that moment when he kind of comes to her at the end, like it's an incredibly powerful moment. And I'm sorry, which, which film is this? The uh, the, the open mouth or the, the mouth. Oh yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. It's incredibly uh, emotional, raw moment. No, there's there's a, you know, PLA is not gonna make death look nice. Yeah. And I remember in one of his last interviews, he, he was, uh, um, I remember one of the phrases he used is like, you know, death, it's not an improvement. In other words, he doesn't see the direction of our lives as being towards improvement or towards amelioration, towards anything good. He always had his view on that uh, rather grim end point. Uh, and another, another French director who I know is a big influence on you, um, Eric Romer. Yeah, and um, uh, I was thinking about how contemplation in his in his films, walking, thinking, how that relates to your your aesthetic. I think that he was the guy for me. I mean, he wasn't necessarily my only favorite filmmaker. I mean, Hawks, Howard Hawks, who I don't ever, I don't try to emulate Hawks because that just feels impossible to me. He was the person that got me into cinema. But Romare was the person when I saw his movies, when I was what, like 17, 18, I instantly thought that's, I instantly felt like that was the way to do it, that that was how I was going to try to do things. So he's just baseline to me. Like I, I, I don't even think about it when all else is, goes out of my mind, I just like do, you know, follow the Romare playbook because it just feels like elemental cinema to me. I think that um, a, a, apart from the fact that his compositions and, and his filmmaking is, is so direct and simple, and apart from the fact that I think his personality resembles mine in certain ways and that I think we both have this kind of like forbidding something forbidding us to take pleasure, forbidding us to like cut loose. Like, and, and we make, I think that finds its way into his movies and maybe into mine. But also I think his big, I think what he really it, it gave the cinema that people could use, people that people could see and could use is that he was quite determined. Uh, he was quite convinced that people talk a lot more in reality than they do in movies as a general rule. And that a lot of talk in a Romare film does not mean a lot to say. It does not mean a philosophical perspective. For him, it's a form of realism. For him, it's like dispensing with a kind of a dr the dramatic shorthand of keeping speeches you know, pithy and to the point in order to facilitate a drama. He felt like um, by letting people talk and talk and talk, you were getting something that was, you know, among other things, completely natural and real. And fam famously, he said, you know, when he decided to improvise a movie, which turned out to be The Green Ray, his, his you know, most acclaimed film, really, when he, he said, um, you know, I just want to prove that in real life, people talk this much. <laughs> he didn't write the script, he just let them go at it. And it's, it's kind of a little bit hard to tell the difference between that film and, and some of the others in, in a way. So I think that was something that appealed to me also, this kind of way of, of working against the conventional dramatic structure by just introducing this element of reality, which happens to be that people you know talk a lot. 
Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, a, a final um, French director. Um, I know that you mentioned in relation to Romare, um, the director um, Jacques Toulon, or Toulon, Toulon. Oui. and um, how he, he's in all of his characters and Romare is a bit more mysterious. Thought that yeah. Was I think Dwayne is is a great great director, and he is. I think he is like kind of almost the embodiment of the idea of fantasy in in movies and in fiction. It's always for him. You you feel like almost all his movies imagine with him lying on his bed, daydreaming about something that appeals to him, some woman, some some one of his children, you know, and then he just you could see in the construction, his fantasy turning into the structure is like kind of an intense wished for kind of situation. And then what makes him great is not that he can fantasize because everybody can fantasize and a lot of fantasies are really um, self-serving and limiting and don't really, you know, don't easily generalize, but he complicates his own fantasies instinctively. So when you're watching a Dwayne film, you feel a, a central fantasy that runs into all these barriers that he places there, these interesting barriers, and then people get around the barriers in a fan fantasy-like way, and, it, it, and, and so on. And every square inch of the movies is filled in with something that he found personally fascinating and that he you know, wishes would happen. <laughs> So um, it's, he's kind of like a pole to me of a certain uh, kind of filmmaking uh, where, where uh, something, a desire is at the heart of the fictional impulse. It is for everybody, but he just makes it naked and then he complicates it in such interesting ways. I mean, there's just an extremely intelligent uh, mind behind those movies. I, I really like him a lot. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, was, th I was watching some of, the, some of the films recently and the, it struck me the, the lot of physicality in this film, sort of altercation, and of course kind of comes to the forefront with uh, love battles. And I just thought that, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a film when you read it on paper, it's like, do I want to see this movie? What is this movie going to be about? <laughs> but he knows enough to like, he, he can put just enough self-awareness and uh, self-conscious behavior in there to justify this fantasy, which is a, a, a strange fantasy on the face of it, you know? Yeah, but uh, for sure, I mean, he's, he's not interested in anything except intimacy. Um, and intimacy for him, as for a lot of people, it's not so distinctive, involves physicality, not just, you know, sex, but physicality in general. Um, it, it, I think that's a consequence of A, him totally being about intimacy and B, um, exploring every avenue of it. Uh, and that's like the exploring every avenue is kind of a big part of him. It's like when you, the story of his films, the central idea of his films is gonna be elaborated infinitely and go into every corner. And if that central idea is an intimate one, as it always is with him, I think, then you're going to see intimacy manifest itself in a number of different ways among a number of different people. I love the way that in a own film, there might be somebody who we never meet who's on the phone and you hear their dialogue and once they too are participating in this elaborate, intelligent fantasy, um, he, he doesn't leave anybody out. He doesn't exclude anybody from this vast kind of global uh, network of, of, of fantasy associations. Um, what, would I be right in thinking that he's le somewhat less regarded outside of France than like, Romare and Pila? Yeah, I, I think probably that's right, but I don't think it's that, uh, it's, it's not super dramatic, but yeah, uh, Pila had his day at a certain point more than Dwayne did. Dwayne was, was distributed a lot in the United States. In the 70s even, um, his films would come here. Uh, you know, La Droles came here and uh, 
La Femme qui pleure, the, the crying woman came here, he, he would get distribution and he never stopped getting it completely, even in the dry periods like the 80s, you know. The Dwayne film would show up, he was on people's radar. There was a, Romero was obviously New Wave, Kaye, all the, at the ground floor of the whole movement in France towards uh, small, and personal filmmaking. But both Piala and Doyon and Ustache and several other people are uh, Garel. No, I don't know if I want to put Garel there because he wasn't making films early. Yeah, maybe anyway, these people were all considered like the 70s generation. They kind of were considered a generation of filmmakers that followed the new wave that kind of absorbed some of it, but expanded into different areas. A lot of those people tended to deal more with uh, political and social issues too. Um, and that there's a lot of good filmmaking that goes on in that post new wave 70s generation. It's not clear to me that that stuff is inferior in quality to the, to the original uh, Kaye Nouvelle Vague. And that's a compliment because quality is very high there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could I could I ask you about um, Garel actually, as you mentioned him? I know you're not a as big a fan, but um... yeah, he's he's such an interesting guy. But I don't quite always get there with him. And it's true. You'd think you'd think you know that he would be kind of right up my alley, like. Dwayne, his films are very personal and almost like uh, emanations of his consciousness. Unlike Dwayne, I don't think he works as hard to externalize this internal process. And so very often I feel like I'm seeing some, some fragment, uh, some, some aspect of life that was is extremely meaningful to him and I'm getting that rather than a projection of what it might mean to me. I, this is, it's, I never feel quite as good like talking about why I don't get filmmakers because obviously when you don't get them, you're not as on top of the situation. But yeah, I do, I, once in a while I, I respond more to him. He certainly got a, a personality and, and a gift, but he's not, He's not someone that strikes to my heart the way that the way that Pila or Doyon or Ustache does. Um, it, it, it's uh, some barrier between what's in his mind and what comes across to me. Some some gap is not bridged somehow. And um, I wanted to ask about um, um, Howard Hawks. Mm -hmm. I've been watching uh, a lot of lately, and I know he's a, a favorite of yours. You go yeah. back with him a long way, I think, from when you yeah. came to the farm. Yeah, but I, I walked into To Have and Have Not uh, in, on November 10th, 1972, as a dilettante, and I came out of the theater as a committed film goer. I instantly started seeing hundreds of movies a year, so I can date, you know. The, the, you know, my cinephilia and pinpoint it to that one experience. Um, and he's always going to be, to me, the center of cinema and, and the, the greatest filmmaker. I don't, I mean, he worked in a different context than I did, than I ever could. And, you know, my first movie, which is very, you know, crude video. I don't know if you've ever heard of Polly Perverse Strikes Again. Oh, I've seen it, yeah. You have, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so that film was a script that I started writing in 1980, back before I realized that I was never going to be a commercial filmmaker and never going to sell a script, back before I started like writing scripts only for myself. And it's the only film I ever did that where there's some of this kind of love of old Hollywood that didn't get adapted, you know, out. Uh, eventually I started making 
films that were just like art films, I think. But that at that one point, I still was part of me was still thinking I wanted to do that kind of thing of of, of combining genre and uh, interesting stuff and just kind of pushing it a little further. And I used to describe uh, Polly Perverse as a, a cross between bringing up baby and the mother and the whore. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I even did that in my one and only uh, Hollywood script conference or industry script conference. <laughs> and the person didn't know either either one of those movies. Um, but, uh, but the character is in uh, Polly Professor named after the bringing up baby characters. So that, you know, the guy's last name is Huxley, same as Cary Grant and bringing up baby. And I would originally named the other characters after. Um, they, they were rough analogs to Susan Vance and, and, and Miss Swallow, except that in bringing up baby, except that I wanted to give Miss Swallow a, a fairer shake than I think she got in the Hawks, Dudley Nichols uh, script. She was just kind of omitted in favor of the uh, appeal and horror of that what kind of wildlife that Catherine Hepburn represented. I wanted to make the representative of, of normality a little bit more formidable and a little bit bigger a part of the film. But after that, I, I, I don't know. Other people would have to say, tell me if any of Hawks creeps into my films. What Hawks is for me is this uh, double layered thing where he, he sets up he sets up a genre thing. He sets up something where you have expectations of it coming out a certain way with a certain weight and a certain uh, dramatic uh, substance. And then when he when the camera rolls, he he plays everything a little faster and a little smaller and a little less emphatic. He will try to confound our expectations of dramatic import. And he may, for him, that's a kind of form of realism when you expect somebody to say something heavy and they say it light or they say it fast. He, for him, that feels realistic, but it's also playing against a context that he himself set up. He sets up the conventional structure and he undercuts it. Um, it's a lot of work to do. It would be a real lot of work to do if you were not inside an entertainment industry, which he was and never thought of himself as being outside of that. Um, but uh, certainly that's something that, you know, that's a principle that, that one encounters from time to time, but no one, no one did it as, as often or as, as uh, intensely as Hawks for me. I've been reading um, uh, Robin Wood's uh, book on Hawks and the, the monograph as well on Rio Bravo, and I was uh -huh. particularly struck by the the personal note, which I had no idea about that he was he was he was going through um, hospital expecting an operation and maybe not to go through it, and then the the book was like inspiration, like when it was over, to say that you know he'd been thinking about how Hawks's characters deal with death and that got him through that period, it's extraordinary. Yeah, um, that's, I don't remember that. That's, is that in the monograph? Yeah, it's in, it's uh, just before it started. In the BFI yeah. monograph, yeah, because I've read, but I'm much more familiar with the book, which, which he, uh, the, the Cinema One book, and his essay on Rio Bravo and that, which is kind of classic, yeah. classic essay. Yeah, you know, you could, you could approach Hawks as a kind of a master of life. And I think, that's going to depend on your life. You know, I mean, that kind of stoicism in the face of death is admirable. There's a lot of things about Hawks that may be more admirable, maybe less admirable. Maybe some of us might agree with them and some might not. He, I think his filmmaking, I would say his filmmaking is more than just a visualization of how to live because that's, that's controversial, I think, on the face of it. If you try to visualize how to live, you, I don't know, like, you know, if you can just get by on that, you certainly can't get by with anything outside of a, of a, a coterie of devotees, you know, but, uh, but he's more. <laughs> I think you can, like, not feel 
that you want to approach the world in a hoxie manner. You can feel that he's too hard, too selective, whatever, too judgmental. And I don't think that necessarily gets in the way of appreciating him if, if, you, if one does happen to feel that way. I mean, one of the aspects of Hox is, you, is controversial, especially to people who don't like him. You know, he, his characters are, are, can, can be very hard, very uh, hard, even on the ones that they love. They could have kind of refuse to, they refuse to help in any obvious way. Sometimes they'll make an excuse for it. They'll say, oh, you know, you know, be nice to him and he'll crumple up in little pieces, you know, but they aren't nice. They have this kind of like harsh way of helping others. Is that, is, if, does one accept Hawks's philosophical interpretation of that harshness? You may, or you may not. Does it mean that, you know, one can't get into the movies? Not for me. I think that it's like, uh, you know, I, I love talks like uh, with a childish passion when I was you know, younger and I can understand the impulse to take him as an oracle and as a model. But these days and for a long time, I just tend to see him as an incredibly adept uh, filmmaker and manipulator of levels of, of realism. And, um... Hawks' mise-en-scene then, compared to, let's say, John Ford, seems to be um, very, like I was, I was watching Rio Bravo. Um, I, I teach um, kind of small tutorials and we did one on the Western. We were looking at Rio Bravo and we were, we were looking at some Ford as well. And obviously the, the, the visual styles are quite different. And I know you're a, you're a Ford fan as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they are. I mean, Hawks is... Hawks, you know, people like a lot of people would say that his films are scaled down to human size. That's true. Fords are not. Ford has this long view of eternity, you know, and a lot of his uh, long shots are very important in Ford. And it's a part, it's not just a visual thing. Ford is always contextualizing everything as some kind of future past, you know, as He's always memorializing the present as it's going to presumably be remembered from some distant point in the future. Um, Hawks is an interesting visual artist in that I don't think he ever edited his films. And I don't think he ever said much to his editors. And you can see it. You can see it doesn't have that kind of clickety-clack sort of... Uh, you know, it has to actually, you don't see that kind of uh, calculated visual approach. I think that he just said, I, you know, that's their job. <laughs> They'll handle it for me. Um, you know, I think, that, I don't know to what extent he intervened, but I don't think it was a great extent. So he has a certain kind of composition he likes. He has a certain, certain rhythms that are very important to him. Um, but I think a lot of his formal, chops are not necessarily visual chops. It's not like he was neglectful of that. The images are beautiful to me, but I, I, I think he's a master of form, but I think we have to, I think it's wise for us to like see form as extending beyond composition and beyond visual play. And if once one does that, he, uh, he looks much more like a formalist. Uh, definitely not on, on, on the same level as Ford, though, who I believe, if he didn't edit his films, he certainly had something in mind. It's a famous story about um, him uh, putting his hat in front of the camera right where he wanted the close-up to be. So he'd do a long shot, and he didn't trust anybody to like cut it the right way, so he just would eliminate the part of the long shot where he wanted the close-up to be. <laughs> so there we perceive first of all, a contentious personality, be uh, uh, somebody who uh, didn't completely feel like they were part of an entertainment industry or felt like they had to like give the entertainment industry a helping hand in interpreting their stuff. Hawks maybe saw himself a little bit more as one with the entertainment industry. I don't think he ever thought he was gonna make an art film. 
I don't think he ever thought he was working in any way that his bosses didn't want him to work. I think he felt like everybody was basically trying to do the same thing. Or a little bit more of a closet artist. And um, I've been reading a lot of Robin Wood as well. And um, his later works on um, Simon Yang in, in Cine Action, which are quite beautiful. Uh, I'm just kind of struck by Wood kind of revisiting opinions years later. I just think that's really interesting after 20, 30 years. And obviously he went in different directions. He obviously became quite political. He certainly um, did. And we were, when I was like in my like uh, youth, like I was reading a lot of stuff right when he was transitioning. And boy, were we perplexed. Um, he was, you know, so influenced. I mean, he, he would be always the first one to admit the early influence of, of the literary critic, Levis. And um, he basically, I think, saw himself as just bringing Levis criticism to film. Uh, and it made a lot of us want to read Levis because we liked him so much. And when he made his transition, he made it. He made it pretty big time. I mean, you can see, you can trace the transition a little bit. He says that if you read the essays in Personal Views, the collection of, uh, the collection that got published sometime in the 70s, 80s, I'm trying to remember. He said you can kind of trace the evolution through those those essays, but uh, but it was it was a change that I don't think too many people made at the same time as him, or if they did, uh, hard to time it with him. It was a big personal convulsion. Uh, I have to admit that I am more devoted to the early funny ones, you know, uh, as Woody Allen said, to the uh, to the uh, Levis period, yeah. of which there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff that he did that is not even not as well known as the Hawks and Hitchcock books. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Simon Yang, um, a director I'm trying to, you know, very particular trying to get into. I, I was at a point where I, he, he was in, he was in Dublin actually, where I live and uh, Simon Yang. And I, I kind of passed him in the lobby of the, the Irish Film Institute. And I, I'd heard about his films, but I hadn't, hadn't seen them. And Tony Raines was there as well. And I didn't feel I knew enough about Asian cinema to talk to him either. But I've watched a lot of Simon Yang now. And uh, it's, it's really interesting considering this idea of the, the Eastern aesthetic to have the, uh, the frame empty and you know actors walk in and out and just that idea yeah. of time. Uh, in a different, well, he's you know. he's a funny guy, you know, and I mean funny as in humorous, as in like really funny dry humor, which he gradually. Uh, I mean, he went he went more towards like pure arty stuff. He if you see an early sci film after seeing some recent ones, it's a little bit of a shock because. You can't believe he was that entertaining or willing to be that entertaining. And by early, I don't mean like pre, I mean, even like main period. Zai feels ridiculously entertaining and uh, audience oriented compared with where he wound up. I mean, you get the feeling now that, you know, cinema for him is something very different than it was originally. And that he's kind of moved himself almost towards a certain, uh, you know, I don't want to say uh, like a, a museum kind of art, but he definitely is like not interested anymore in doing the same thing he was. But he's a, he's a funny, funny guy. And his still frames, his long shots and his immovable things are among other things, very deadpan, hum funny humor, you know? And he, he works it hard. And his sense of humor is far ranging and is not restricted to things that we might think were funny on the face of it. Um, I personally kind of, I mean, I, I hope he can do whatever he wants to. He's a great director, but I kind of sort of wish he would uh, work a little bit more uh, towards the audience than he does these days. Whatever, it's fine. He's, 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 I'm not going to give him advice. He's better than I am. Uh, I wanted to ask you about um, 
um, I suppose pre pre COVID uh, sort of I guess the New York film scene and uh, and how you found making films over the years. It changed a lot. First, there was nothing. First, there was nothing at all. No scene. No anything. And uh, I made a couple of movies in that vacuum. And I think the first glimmer of camaraderie of groupness came with kind of mumblecore. It, with the whole uh, first video had to come along and be good enough that you could make a movie that was presentable with, with very little technical chops, you know, video had to be good enough where you just turn the camera on and you get a decent image. And that happened sometime around the mid 2000s. Um, and then I think there were a couple personalities, Swanberg especially, who really kind of promoted that sort of group feeling. And it was international, it was not international, but it was intercontinental, it was all over the country. You know, the Mumblecore people were in different places, Bujalski was in you know, Boston, Swanberg was in Chicago. Uh, there, there was no unity of, of place. They all had their film show at South by Southwest. They all knew each other from the festival circuit. They made friends. A couple, you know, a couple personalities like Swanberg probably had a lot to do with that being a, a group, like being a, people seeing each other not as rivals, which I felt when I was, when I was a kid, I felt that somehow from a lot of filmmakers um but but that in that at that time the stakes were so low the costs were so low i don't know everyone started hanging out together and knowing each other and i was kind of you know not really making films like that exactly but i liked some of those filmmakers a lot and uh, got to know some of them so that was like the first time i saw a, a, a kind of a, a, a unity at all. And there was some of it was in New York too. I mean, those guys would come to New York, but then also some of the people associated with that kind of moment, people like Nathan Silver and Dustin Guy DeFay were in New York. And so there was like, a, there was a, a little bit of a community even, even locally. But after that, after Mumblecore started to move into its next phase, you know, and after everybody started making bigger films or different films or whatever, a different group kind of started to arise in New York. And I think a lot of it coalesced around uh, the presence of Matias Pinheiro, the Argentine filmmaker who um, I was going to say lived here. He still does live here, but who knows where it's all going to fall out after this pandemic. I think he's, he's not been in New York during it. But uh, Matias uh, and... Uh, and Graham Swan, his producer, uh, who uh, worked for Cinema Guild for a while and then worked for Kino Lorber, um, started gathering uh, this kind of film buffy group of filmmakers around them. And so this formalist kind of wing of the New York indie cinema started forming. And you'd see them at Matthias's house and at gatherings, you know, Ricky Dambrose and Bing Bryant and Kyle Mosan and uh, um, Ted Fent. Uh, these were all people that were, were moving in that circle. So that's kind of the more, most recent evolution, I think, of that of that scene. Um, some other people maybe were came into it and left. Ted definitely left. Um, but it, it, it's, it's a shifting thing. And I've been like making like movies once every X years, you know, once every five or 10 years since, you know, I was 30 years old. So see, I'm used to scenes changing around me. I'm just glad there's a scene at all to tell you the truth. And you're, you're working on a, on a new film, a, a new script moment. Yeah. I'm working on a new script. It's, it's based on a treatment that I did 20 years ago. And it's a little too big for me to self-finance. And so I never did it. But after 14, some people talked to me about maybe possibly getting some grant money from here or there. 
and I have no, I'm, I'm mistrustful of, of like, you know, the world as far as filmmaking goes. I feel like if I can't finance it myself, I can't necessarily be sure it's gonna happen. But here I am writing this script, which if it did get made, would be like a wonderful thing. I always thought of it as kind of my dream project. It's a lot different from a lot of the things I've done. The dialogue is not sparkling. The, the main character is inarticulate and unself-aware. Um, I make a lot of films about women and he's like an old dude, you know, an old like businessman. Um, so I'm kind of like, it'd be really nice to see this happen, but, and I'm writing it, but you may never see it. <laughs> no one, no one may, have, maybe no one will see it. And um, you mentioned um, articulate characters. I was noticing looking back over your, over your films, the, the women are very articulate, the men sometimes a little less articulate in, in certain instances. Um, how do you find um, writing characters? I, um, you know, I think that you just kind of like let your fantasy go a little bit around the basic concept. I like words. And so if someone can say words, I give them words. Um, I never think of trying to write, you know, any particular kind of dialogue. I never think about trying to write comic dialogue. I never think about trying to write dialogue with intellectual content. Um, but it usually happens, you know, most of my movies, it usually happens that the characters are, you know, have, are thoughtful in some way, even if they don't have a handle on their own problems, they can talk a blue streak around them. And you know, it's, 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 it's fun because words are fun. Uh, I don't know if it's a commitment on my part. It doesn't seem to be a commitment since I'm now trying to write a script uh, around somebody who uh, ha is not a philosophical kind of guy at all and who kind of has philosophy thrust upon him by circumstances. Um, and this script is coming up really short and I have to keep telling myself, don't worry, it's only 50 pages because this guy doesn't like to talk. <laughs> um, we'll see what happens when it's all done. But I, uh, it, it's, I think it's, it's not a, it, it's a form of characterization. It's not, a, it's not as if I feel as if there is literary content to the words it, the, in my movies. I, I actually really don't usually go that way at all. I don't have any kind of abstraction where I want there to be literary content in them. I kind of follow Romare and try to subjugate the characterizations and the dialogue to some overall sense of the of the situation, of the uh, events. Another, uh, another director I wanted to ask you about, um, Alan Clark. Mm. Um, I watched uh, Road recently, which I loved, and also uh, Rita Sue and Bob Two. Uh, that was the first one I saw by him was Rita Sue, and I didn't see any for a while after that. He wasn't really getting into theaters here anyway. I mean, I don't know if you saw the stuff when it was on TV, was that the case? But uh, here, the, we, we, got a, uh, we saw that one cut of, of um, Scum, and then Rita Sue, and that was it, as far as theatrical stuff goes. Did you, were you were you uh, aware of him while while the stuff was airing? On uh, no, it would have been when I was a film student over a decade ago. A few people had seen Scum, and then obviously the famous tracking shots, and then I I discovered some more. There's a lot of them on on YouTube now. A lot of the BBC yeah. stuff. Yeah, but it's. Yeah, it's... In general, for me, we've talked a lot about like uh, UK and and you know. <laughs> British Islands filmmakers that uh, I like and you like, but those people were not part of our film history while it was happening. We didn't know anything. We didn't, you know, Mike Lee is making all these amazing movies through the 80s. We didn't know. Stephen Frears had this amazing backlog. Alan Clark. I mean, there's so many people who 
I consider like dominate that period now. Like if I look back on my favorite films of those periods, those all these films that were coming out of like BBC or whatever are really important. And we didn't know about them at all. And we didn't think of the eighties in terms of those films at all. And so it's one of those like tricks of film history where you have to like keep a little bit of uh, uh, humility of, you know, modesty about your judgments of a decade. You don't know when someone's gonna dig up all the best stuff that you didn't even know about and show it to you. And um, what about Irish films then? Have you, I know obviously Stephen Freer has made The Snapper, but English, but um, mm -hmm. was Neil Jordan, I guess, and Jim Sheridan, probably the best known ones. Yeah. I don't know if there's been ones on a bigger scale that have had maybe a lot as lasting an impression as somebody like Alan Clark or Lee. Like, I mean, I suppose it's different, but. I'm trying to think about it. I wish that's, this is one thing I wish I'd prepared because I probably have a little list. I do have a little list somewhere of like all the different countries where directors I've liked by countries. Um, I never, I'm not a huge Neil Jordan guy. I mean, I was kind of, interested in him and have come close but he didn't really stick with me and I can't say I've really uh, enjoyed uh, Sheridan's films that I've seen all that much um there was I, I wish it's too bad it would be too disruptive to your audience if I like went into the next room and got my little list and tried to look there was a guy named Brethnock Patty Brethnock you know oh yes name? yeah he did a film that I liked, but I'm trying, to, I can't remember the name of it right now. It wasn't, so I went two, down. Say it again. Uh, I went down, Brendan Gleeson. No, I don't think it was that, it had numbers in the title. Mm. Something like two by two or one, I can't remember. Anyway, I, I, I don't always like categorize, have like to my fingertips, like which Irish films I might've liked best, but I, and I better not uh, disrupt your, your, your show by like running off to get a list. But mm -hmm. <laughs> I, it was one point, I think Neil Jordan, like I, I was interested in him at the beginning and then I, I didn't follow him too strongly after a certain point. Um, yeah, no, I, I um, kind of grow up, grew up with Mona Lisa. That would have been my favorite film as a teenager. Uh, yeah, because I think he was he was based over in, in England at that point, and he came back and he made a film. Uh, I live in a seaside town, and the film is called The Miracle, and it was all shot here. I think Jordan used to live here. Uh, Ardmore Studios. I don't know if you you know it's it's a big studio here. It's they made um, um, made a lot of films here. That what well, John Borman pretty much makes all of his films at Ardmore. So that's like a kind of a, a big studio about ten minutes from me. So um, I know so it's called the miracle that you're talking about. This is the miracle, yeah. I've never seen it now. It's only been available on video or something, and I haven't been able to find it. But uh, just sort of been nice to see what uh, what Bray was like in the, in the early nineties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish I could. I wish I could come up with uh, with more names. I probably will think of them after I after I get off. And, you, and have you have you been to uh, visit Ireland or? No, I never did. I think it almost happened once and didn't for some reason. I, I've barely been to the British Isles at all. I think I spent like, I was once, I was once in London and Brighton in the UK and that's about it. Um, Brighton was nice. Yeah, it was Brighton for me is that Robert Hamer movie. Um, what's the name of that first? Pink String and Ceiling Wax? Yeah, yeah I, that, that's Brighton for me. <laughs> When you um you you mentioned that and I I'd, I hadn't seen it and I absolutely loved it, thought it was great. Uh, the hey, Hamer is kind of amazing, actually. Yeah. 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 He's a, he's a I mean he might not have held up completely through the whole course of his career, and you know whatever you hear stories about him having a hard life personally, but boy he was knocking it out of the park on a regular basis for a while. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, the spider and the fly oh i haven't seen that one. Oh, um, yeah. do so do so yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, i have um i have a book on british cinema um critic who we 
talked about a little bit before uh, Raymond Durnias, uh, yeah. of England, uh, quite a an interesting critic. I know, obviously, he's for some reason very uh, anti hawks. I, I, he's very to... anti hawks. Yeah. <laughs> he made a, he made a crusade of it, and that did not endear him to me at the time. Um, and I never have I've read a bunch of his stuff, but I haven't completely gone back to reevaluate with a cooler adult head. Um, I met him once. I think I mentioned to you. He was. Oh, really? he was, oh he was no. Teaching. It was not a. It was not a significant meeting. He was when I was at UCLA. He, he was teaching there for a semester, and I. Uh, I kind of popped my head in his office once and said something to him about having read something of his, and he was, not, in a socializing mood. I, I had the feeling maybe he wasn't a socializing kind of fellow in general, but I, I don't know that. Yeah, and no, I've, I've heard that. Um, I think uh, Adrian Martin sent him a letter and he wrote back and said, don't contact me again or something. <laughs> you know, film buffs, I, this is my, these are my people and this is my country. And we're mostly a little mentally ill, you know? We all spend a lot of time in dark rooms through the years when other people are learning how to live and have romantic relationships and stuff. And we're like watching movies. And I don't say this is bad. I don't regret it. I think it's been my avenue towards like a lot of other things. I think by immersing yourself in one thing a lot, if you handle it right, the right way, it can broaden you instead of narrow you. And I feel like the movies did that to me, but I never see, I never look at any kind of uh, socially disadvantaged film buff and think of that person as other. I think of that person as me and my people and all the human wreckage that we are, you know, all of us who showed up in movie theaters for years and talked about this stuff, and maybe didn't have great social lives. Uh, those are, those are my people, you know, really, I, I, I never want to distance myself from all the, all the, mental illness that drove all of us into movie theaters. <laughs> kind of a, fun, a funny way to put it, but but it, it's true. We, we, you know, something has to be a little bit, you know, I, I maybe know one or two filmmakers, film buffs who cut a wide swath through social life, you know? And I know some people who put it one place or another, but for the most part, we were a, we were a slightly socially disadvantaged bunch. And whatever, you know, that's our, that's our, that's our identity. Uh, and um, you're, you're, what you're, so you're working during the week, and you're, you're getting time to watch, watch some a lot of movies at home. I'm watching. Time. I have a, I have a ritual nighttime screening every night, which I rarely miss, and which is very different from the theatrical. Yeah, you know, movie life that I was living for this pandemic, but I not knocking it exactly. I, I kind of like it, and I really um, put a lot of weight on this evening screening. And uh, you know, sometimes I use a random number generator to try to select a film from among the things that are sitting on my hard disk or whatever, which is really kind of cool because it comes up with it, things that I wouldn't have taken otherwise. Um, Last night, I watched a film by uh, the Japanese director Kawashima uh, uh, called Women Are Born Twice, which I'd seen once and really liked. And it's this amazing movie. And we were talking about Hawks and Hawks' use of like playing things down. And I was thinking of Hawks when I was watching Kawashima. He would do these little bits of naturalism. He would deploy bits of naturalism the way the Hawks would in a way to try to uh, take a take a convention and turn it into something odd or distinctive and he'd take his use his familiarity with environments and with rituals the way people would behave and he would put things in that you wouldn't normally put in and he would do that to defamiliarize something that was like already an existing expectation that the audience had so it was like kind of fun things like that where you like make a connection between you know this uh, very two very un dissimilar filmmakers that's like the joy of like being able to select your own screenings at home 
I saw a lot of films by uh, in the summer by Sales, the uh, Iranian filmmaker who emigrated to Germany, um, and who I think is a great filmmaker. And uh, this, I was completely convinced the more of his films I saw, and I think I saw almost all of them, uh, the, the more I became convinced he's like a major figure that really needs to have his status elevated, significantly elevated. I don't know if I'm going to be uh, around to see that, but I, I think it will eventually happen. So that was like a fun summer. I was like going through all these like grainy TV recordings of films by Sohrab Shahid Sales. Uh, very much worth your while if you feel like doing a little exploring. Oh, absolutely. Oh, that sounds great. Um, I want to ask you as well about um, uh, Bazan. So I know you've a long mm -hmm. relationship with him as well. and. I think, was it this seventies that you started reading him? Yeah, I think that's accurate. I don't. I started reading uh, all film stuff in the seventies. I think I became a film buff in seventy two. I discovered Saris's The American Cinema in seventy three, and I started. I know that I, you know, I remember doing a very elaborate presentation on Bazin in film school, maybe in seventy six or seventy seven. So yeah, definitely seventies. Um, he's the guy, you know, I mean, I don't know. He was very unpopular when I discovered him because I, I was discovered when I, he, you know, I went to graduate school and theory was like ascendant and triumphant. And he was just like one more impressionistic kind of dude that was, was rejected by, by the, by the critical theory crowd. But, um, but I really do think he's like the, the best mind to apply itself to the cinema. And what he did in a few years, what he came up with, I mean, to me, that stuff is like, you know, it's worthy of like all this, you could just like sit and like take it apart word by word over the years, do these like Talmudic study groups on it and still and continue to get interesting stuff out because he was a journalist you know he was not writing polished things always um sometimes the ideas have to be coaxed out of it sometimes he doesn't you know doesn't he buries the lead or doesn't quite get to the thing that you might want to emphasize but it's it's there's a lot there and uh and you know in, on first acquaintance he uh you know he's thought of as like uh, the exponent of realism in cinema. He's, he's like definitely serves that function in critical history as the person that stands athwart, uh, you know, the, the, the whole, uh, you know, 30s, 40s idea that cinema had to distinguish itself from theater and had to be different and the importance of editing and the importance of, you know, all the things that other art forms couldn't do. And he's the one who basically uh, made it possible for people to think that just turning on a camera and recording something was a, uh, an essential act. So I think he serves that kind of function for, for people. Uh, uh, but he's also like, he's also like, there's almost something mystical about him. And it's not like he's a mystic. It's like there was the mysticism standing between him and the screen and he just had to identify it, you know? And he, and he didn't try to shove it in your face, but he would say, you know, the image, you know, is, is the reality. <laughs> it's not a depiction of, it's not indexical. It's not a, it is, it exists. <laughs> and, you know, you try to get your mind around this and you feel almost like you're trying to interpret some kind of mystical, uh, Oracle, instead of like reading a, a you know, a carefully reasoned uh, piece, which, which his pieces are, he's, he's a very reasonable guy. But I love that he was standing in front of this mystery, this mystery of the photograph, this kind of uncanniness of the photograph. And he did not shirk, uh, he did not dodge the uncanny thing that was that was right in his face and couldn't be couldn't be avoided if you wanted to talk about cinema. Oh, that's lovely. Um, and, and there was obviously a lot of kind of film theory, kind of very rigorous frameworks in those days in the 70s. I've only read 
bits and pieces of people like Blur, a little bit of Mulvey, but would did that ever did you ever read much of that or well I read a little it wasn't my thing I actually think some of it's like some of it's good uh when it when it when it doesn't try to present itself as the only thing I think that 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 I was always into aesthetics and a certain extreme form of theorist doesn't even seem to believe in aesthetics doesn't concern itself whatsoever with the idea of a good work of art or a bad work of art, um, is not interested, you know, treats it like a art, cultural artifact, like a lot of other things. But I don't know, some of that stuff was, some of that stuff is, is useful, I think. I, I, I personally really am happy that I read uh, Roland Barthes. Um, I think he's, I think he was important to me. Um, I can't say I ever got too deep into the the semiotic thing, you know, at that time, Christian Metz was all the rage. And I can't say I really, you know, responded, got anything huge out of that. And the structuralist thing is like, on the one hand, it connects so easily to a certain, you know, something that you see in all movies. And definitely a book that was important to me, which is uh, Jim Kitts's uh, Horizons West about Anthony Mann, Bud Bedeker, and Sam Peckinpah. Uh, in that Cinema One series, you could see that he had drawn on structuralist stuff, but on the other hand, it, on the other hand, it, either, it never cut too deep for me. Um, and I'm very much in in real life, you know, outside of my cinema life, I, I, I consider myself a Freudian. I consider myself, uh, I consider Freud like a really, really important figure and one of the people that organized my thoughts about human beings. And still to this day is true. And yet Freud in theory, in film theory, as transmitted by Lacan, I never was really sure that that was speaking to the issue. And people used to, I mean, I, uh, people used to like try to, you know, take interpretation of dreams and, and, and apply it to the cinema. I felt like there was some missing steps there. Uh, so I wouldn't say I'm opposed, um, but I never was my, I, when I started feeling like I wanted to, you know, go deeper into cinema, I didn't go in that direction. Yeah, I, I was, um, I was reading a piece by Robin Wood on Leo McCarry from his film comment in the 70s. It's quite a good piece, but there's a section of it where it kind of, like, I, you know, I, I don't mind Freudian references in film theory, but when it becomes the whole framework of seeing the whole film, you know, I don't mind aspects here and there, but it just becomes very reductive and simplistic to me after, you know, after. Yeah. Film. I mean, Freud has a lot to say about people. Freud probably has more to say about people than anybody has to say about people. And I never want to reject that. And, you know, filmmakers are people and the person behind a film is important. But on the other hand, uh, the mediation between the, 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 the dream, the conscious mind and the dream w w material is not exactly the same way that a filmmaker or an artist mediates the connection between their fantasies their desires and the work of art, different mechanisms, different parts of the mind seem involved. Anyway, you know, I'm, I'm in danger of saying something dumb because I, I don't know the, 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 I don't want to criticize, you know, straw people. I don't want to criticize people who don't really exist because I'm imagining, you know, what, what, they're, what they're doing. But I think one has to take into account the aesthetic aims of film. I mean, I'm in it because because of art and I want it to be good art and I want that art to do something particular for me that other things don't do for me. And if you have a kind of criticism that is not interested in that, is not interested in the whole idea of art and what art might do for you that other things don't, don't do and what things, what the com complex of things that are about art that makes it worthwhile or not worthwhile makes it a good experience or not if you're not interested in that i 
it's simply going to be anecdotal for me. And I might be able to use something that someone says. I might be able to bring some idea back. But it's not going to be right to the point of it if it doesn't grapple with the value of art and the idea of like an aesthetic response. Very interesting. Oh, um, uh, I think we can, we can leave it there with the thanks so much, Dan.